All right, thanks. Hi, I'm Larry Babb. I'm a software engineer, and uh, I really appreciate the fact that um, you guys uh, invited me to speak at this conference and have this opportunity. I have a lot to cover. It's 20 minutes, and I, we all go through this when we get up here, but I'm going to really try to go through it and get through it fast so we can have some, some good discussions here. Um, okay, my objective for, for my talk is to really get into um, and demonstrate to the NHGRI group here that we really need to standardize variant specifications and baseline services to enable this technology and that we can do that in five to ten years. And um, so we'll walk through and try to make that case with the hopes that we can um, realize that goal and get some in, uh, increased investment. Oh, I'm not in slide mode yet. Thank you. Perfect. All right, software guys, right? All right, um, <laughs> it's all about us. <laughs> all right, um, all right. So um, that's my, my objective is, again, to, to um, convey the message that we need uh, richer standardizations around variants and other things and baseline services in order to enable this technology and that it can be done in five to 10 years. I think it can be done a lot sooner with the right level of investment, uh, but we'll, we'll go through that as I, as I talk. My experience here, I'm not going to go through this in detail. I just put it in there for information. For those people that don't know me, I don't, haven't done this a lot, so I wanted to you know, make sure I gave some credibility to where I come from. Ba essentially, I've been doing software engineering for 30 years, uh, 15 years in, in the clinical space, and the last 10 years I've been full-time, all out, either on the commercial, academic, uh, um, and public side, just contributing to, as much as I can, these, these types of efforts around genomic knowledge standards and providing IT resources to, to help the community and the vendors out there uh, gain adoption to realize precision medicine goals. It is my passion and my calling at this point. Um, so Terry, when she asked me to do this, she came up with a title about bi-directional data flow from the clinic to the lab and back. And uh, it's great, you could give me any title and I pretty much was gonna talk about this. So uh, I'm gonna go through and really talk about it. <laughs> Uh, and talk about it. I'm not going to get into the details here, but I want to give the whirlwind tour of the state, the current state of the, the clinic lab, clinic workflow today. Um, it's pretty basic. Uh, you know, there's a lot of details behind these boxes, but if we start in the upper left hand corner there and uh, go around from in, in a clockwise direction, we can see that the, essentially the physicians and the patients get together, and at some point there's an order, and the order re requisition is sent to a, a lab along with the biosample that's almost completely done in paper form. There are systems, a lot of big institutions that have their, their closed systems and, and have the money. They, they do have electronic ordering and that kind of thing, but in a lot, a lot of cases they don't, especially if they're doing send outs to labs they're not necessarily connected with. But whether it's electronic or not, it's still fairly crude and there's a lot of uh, effort that goes into there and, and not a lot of information that's um, captured necessarily that's needed by the labs, but enough to get the job done. The lab then uh, goes ahead and runs the wet lab process to, to do the assay, and then that gets invested, that gets um, set up and sent to their case repo where uh, the uh, pathologist, geneticists, genetic uh, counselors, fellows, various people help draft the report, uh, analyze the significance of the uh, variants that are f found in isolation of the variants as well as in the context of the patient to develop a report. If you're lucky, you have a lab that has a variant knowledge management system. Most of them have Excel spreadsheets and all kinds of mechanisms to uh, sort of pull together their variant knowledge. Uh, you know, some of them just rely 100% on bioinformatics tools. There's a whole uh, mishmash of things that are done out there. Um, and then once that report is drafted, it is either electronically uh, sent back, but most of the time faxed back to the ordering physician's facility uh, at where it, it can be uh, uploaded into their EHR, usually just as a narrative report, a PDF, or some electronic form. Very little structured data ever makes it back into the EHR related to the content of the variants found, the phenotypes, and that kind of thing. There's, there's people in this, in this room here that work at institutions where they invest a lot of money trying to make this happen. I happen to have the opportunity to work at Partners Healthcare for 12, 13 years, and they did some enormous amount of investment in making this happen, and we did it, uh, and we did it with some, um, some good success, but it's certainly, <clears throat> certainly not something that scales to the wider community. 
Um, so we need the tools, we need both the lab side software tools and the EHR vendor tools to really play in this space in order to make all this happen. And uh, I think it was Bob Nussbaum yesterday said that, that even if, if the payers paid for this stuff and there was market motivation, there's still an enormous amount of labor that's needed to make this happen. And we don't want to have a bunch of uh, different groups going through and building their own custom solutions because they just won't integrate. It's possible to start l lowering the technical barrier, and that's what we're going to get into a little bit more here. Okay. I think job number one today, the, the low-hanging fruit on the tree from an IT perspective, is to get the variant phenotype standards finally organized. We've been talking about it for, at least I've been talking about it for 10 years now. I've been working with a lot of different groups. There's a lot of good information out there. If we get enough investment and the right group of people together, we can get the ball over the goal line. And we're doing that with, um, you know, we're, we're making some progress in the clinical genomics working group. I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail. But there's groups that are essential to this, in my opinion, today. The ones that are really pushing on this are the Global Alliance and the ClinGen and NCBI, EBI, and, and the various groups that pretty much are participating with the Global Alliance. Um, all right, so this, thanks to Bob Freeman for the next set of slides. This is, uh, the idea here is this slide is to demonstrate the time it takes to develop and, the, um, and how to generalize the interoperability starting from the lower left corner up to the right. So we have academia, consortia, and SDOs, and these are different kinds of use cases for standards where um, you have a shorter time to adoption because you have a smaller group and you're, you're focused on a very specific problem like uh, just a, your own little research study or, or big research study. And until you get to collaborations where things get a little hairier and time starts to really go flipping by before you can get anything done. And then finally, the standards or organizations, which really are the end game to, to get everyone to adopt. And, and those take the uh, largest amount of effort. You can see here an idea of how that might play out. Um, this is not scientific. This is very opinionated. But, but that's all right. Uh, this, this, I think it's right because it's my, my opinion and Bob's and we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and here's a sampling of, of the kind of uh, different groups out there that are doing this kind of work. Um, and here's uh, just more of a concrete example of the ones that, that uh, both Bob and I are involved in that we believe uh, are, are really the, the resources and the projects that are going to make this happen. Uh, I haven't seen any alternatives to this in terms of accomplishing the large scale goals that we're trying to get to. Uh, the ClinGen data exchange and allele registry, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Those are groups I'm uh, highly invested in. We're going to get into the allele registry a little more specifically. Those tools exist today. They're awesome, and everyone should be using them. Um, the Global Alliance work that we're doing is in, in progress, and they've just recently had a reboot where we're, we've got this genomic knowledge standards group that's, that's working on formalizing computational representation of variant representations, not just sequence variants, but copy number variants, structural variants, all those kinds of things, with the idea that we can share that with the HL7s of the world and, and get pilot implementations and real innovators out there, driver projects, to actually implement those things so that the fire groups and the HL7s can then formalize it. And they can work on other problems other than detailed genetic knowledge management and representation, which is a little bit outside their, their um, um, ability due to, you know, the, the level of uh, volunteerism that would need to take to do that. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about HL7. Uh, HL7 right now is in a, in a major shift to go from uh, this version 2, version 3 sort of, I don't want to call it arcane, but I just did. So uh, it's, a, it's sort of an older style way of developing. It's a, it's a little hard to innovate with. Uh, this new fire group has come along, and, and they've really done a complete shift where they're looking at increasing uh, the innovation capability, get more innovators out there involved in developing apps, having a little bit more control over it, applying the standards, and not giving such a high uh, technical barrier to adoption. Uh, you don't have to invest millions of dollars to, to stand up an HL7 certified service. You can actually go out there and build your use case for your example and get others to try it. And if those things work, then, then eventually it will feed into the standards. So it's really um, a very promising tool, technically speaking, or approach, technically speaking, but it's still in the process of becoming normative. It's not quite there yet. Um, the other thing to realize in the clinical genomics space is we are a moving tar target in that it's a rapidly evolving and complicated um, 
uh, domain, and that, that creates uh, a really a conflating factor for developing standards, but we can, again, talk about that when we discuss things. Here's some of the challenges, just real quick, is that the challenges around uh, the clinical genomics work group, which I've participated in, Bob's very involved in it, there's a number of us, Gil, a whole bunch of us are, are related to that group, we go in and out, you know, it's like joining a club and, you know, spinning and then you leave again, you come back and, and try to keep making progress, and it does over time, it's just a little slow. Uh, the reason I think is not because it's a, just because it's a dynamic industry and there's constantly evolving standards, but it's just a broad and deep representation uh, um, domain. In my opinion, the clinical genomics domain is as big or bigger than all of the rest of HL7's domain put together. And right now we have a clinical genomics work group of a dozen people that are really active, maybe 20. It's gaining in, in, uh, in membership. but. We just, we just don't realize yet how, how to, you know, expand this to, to get serious about creating the entities and concepts we need in that space to, to really get the standards over the hump. It's, it's like we're, and I'm going off on a little tangent here, but uh, it's like we're given two or three uh, ways to try to solve all of genetics, and we have to try to fit all this stuff into those two or three ways and it's very frustrating. Um, on the flip side, the, the HL7 fire gods and the, the people that sort of decide when you can create these, these large concepts and these standard concepts, they don't want us to go out and sort of create this model that's not yet standard. So it's this cart and horse problem of, show us the industry standards for these things and we'll give you the resources you need to extend and build and make the adoption really successful. And versus we need to build these concepts so that we can enable the technology to figure out what the standard is. You know, so it's a, it's a cart and horse thing and it's, it's a real challenge. So the clinical genomics work group works really hard within the framework that they're provided by the FHIR group to build everything off these concepts called observation and sequence and diagnostic report. And that's it. Now that observation thing is really cool. It's like a Swiss army knife of objects that you can do things with but you have to write a lot of implementation guidance around it, which is gonna create a barrier for adoption because people see that kind of stuff and they say, this thing isn't ready for real time yet. And I think that's a very big challenge. So how can we help? Um, the way we can help is to create standards in this space that take the burden off of groups like the Clinical Genomics Work Group and say, here's how you do something that's, that's really easy. Uh, I think it was uh, Lisa yesterday when she gave her presentation, she, she had the quote that IC codes are very portable. That's a perfect example. HDNC codes for genes, it's well adopted. We don't have to have the HL7 work group go out there and design what's a gene, how do you deal with aliases, changing things over time. People just use that now and they don't even question it. ICD codes, pretty much the same thing. SNOMED codes, same kind of thing. Their genome reference consortium with their, with their assemblies. Five minutes, I have seven down here. <laughs> All right, great, I'm moving on. All right, next. Uh, so um, so the, the, the key to get there is, in my opinion, is work on these variant specifications and services. It's step one. And uh, what we need to do is we need to get investment in order to speed this process up. It's happening, it's happening at a snail's pace. So until we get this done, we're not gonna to get to the part where IT starts really enabling this technology. I'm gonna to try to do VMC in one minute. This is the variant model, modeling collaboration. Reese Hart was in a group of us here um, uh, and, and other places got together and started creating this, this very specific computable spec for how to define alleles, haplotypes, genotypes, and that kind of thing. And this has become the seed for what the Global Alliance is, is using to define standards right now. So really quick, that's the group. Uh, the mission here is to develop a, a reliable exchange of sequence variation in a ubiquitous way that can be adopted by all. And that, you know, this gets into these things are not the same thing. I, there's no way I'm gonna get into convincing the people in this room that there's a million ways to express the same variant and that's a very big problem. Uh, you might think we're using VCF, we got it covered. That's not it, there's more to it than that. Um, and so, so, you know, here's the example of some multiple representations. What if we do nothing? Then we have this mess where, you know, everybody's using different techniques for passing around this information. In the end, what we end up is with a lot of errors and challenges, which really 
I think everyone understands, and this prevents people from investing in the IT needed to, to get adoption ha happening. All right. 2015, we had a, ClinGen had a collaboration with NCBI to create an allele registry. Uh, Heidi Ream got up at the, uh, e uh, I think it was the ClinGen Decipher meeting down in Washington in 2015 and made the pitch that we really need this allele registry if we're going to figure out how to manage knowledge around variation. It got EBI and NCBI so excited, they came up right after the thing and they said, we want to do this, how do we do it? So ends up, NCBI won that arm wrestling match, EBI said, go, go for it. We worked with Steve Sherry and Melissa Landrum and, and that whole group, and they were fantastic. Worked with them for almost a year, and we got really far. Uh, Steve Sherry did an amazing job of, of pitching it to his leadership there at NCBI, and he was all on board. And one of the biggest points that he brought out is NCBI doesn't want to make the policies for how variation's done. What NCBI wants to do is we'll stand up this public resource. We'll make it ubiquitous so you can have a way for all these vendors out there to get reliable variation service to canonicalize and normalize variation in a consistent way to use in clinical care. But we can't be the policy setting committee. You have to have the community organization come together and do this. And so we started to work on that. We thought, well, ClinGen's the first place to start, but we need to reach out and we got to get HL7 and Global Alliance and all the people in this room on board of how to get that group together. I'd like to consider this thing something like a variant ref variation reference consortium, like a VRC, sort of like the GRC. Maybe uh, so someone yesterday mentioned we should have a ge genome medicine, uh, genomic medicine consortium to do this kind of stuff. That's fine, however it's done. In the end, NCBI ran out of money, as, as all the government things pretty much do, and, um, and they were not able to support the full-blown picture. And what ended up happening is they ended up creating this variation service in Speedy, which ended up normalizing their dbSNP ClinVar databases. I don't think it's done, but in dbSNP 2.0, you're going to see that a lot of these duplicate RSIDs and inconsistencies in dbSNP and ClinVar are going to get resolved. So there was some really good stuff that came out of it that is getting used by the, and hopefully informed, uh, Global Alliance uh, stuff. So. In the end, then, Baylor from the ClinGen did implement this registry. Uh, they've done a fantastic job, and this allele registry exists today, and it's available, and it's open to the public, and it is fantastic from an IT perspective. They did a great job of standing up a very performant, high-throughput, th high high-access, speedy um, um, service. And again, it's called the ClinGen allele registry. I recommend you going down to it. It's at the link below. What it essentially does is it canonicalizes variation. You can send it HGVS, VCF. You can upload thousands and thousands of variants at once. And if there's no ID in the system that it can already get, it will automatically register for you and return it. And now you, as an EHR vendor or a lab vendor, you can pass around this ID instead of this big bucket of data that everyone does differently and try to have everyone understand the different representations. You pass this ID and you have now a centralized service that says, we all know this apple is an apple and it's not an orange, regardless of how people put it in. And it's just a really fantastic service. These kinds of registries are being built today inside of people's software, probably in North Shore system and Intermountain system. I was talking to, to um, Mark Williams right before this. What are they doing in my code for their knowledge management? He, he admitted, we don't have that yet, and uh, we're working on it. So we do it in eMERGE. We, we do it in a lot of places, but this is hard stuff to do. We don't want Epic and Cerner. They're not going to invest in doing this. They're going to wait for someone to do it. They may want to redo it their own way, but but the, the small guys and the innovators out there, they can't even get started sharing variants until we do something like this. I'm convinced, and, and if we don't do it, we're just gonna be having this same discussion in, in 10 or 20 years. So I'll, I'll leave that for the end. Can't go into all these slides, but I, I ref, defer you to, to go look at the slide deck. It's really interesting. Look at this service. Uh, again, just to give you an example, here's a whole array of things that you can pass in to search or bulk query or bulk download or upload. There's over 650 million variants in there right now, unique variants. This is not different versions of the same variant. 650, they have all of exact ClinVar. When they put this data into this, this repository, they were actually able to validate the data that was in ClinVar, and they went back to ClinVar and said, hey, by the way, you have some variants in there that don't seem right, and they were able to work out fixing them. And so this has really been a, quite a collaborative effort b uh, between uh, ClinGen and NCBI and to improve the whole, the whole um, uh, situation. All right, 
Here's an example of some of the resources that are now using this and integrating. ClinVar is putting these CIDs in there. My Variant Info, Civic, the uh, consortium, the VICC group, the Griffith Brothers from McDonald, they have the Civic um, Somatic Variation Tool. They struggled with this. When they set up that crowdsourcing thing, they were like, one of the, you know, there's a paper coming out, I think, in Nature, maybe next month, that they're about to the, uh, do. And one of the sections in there is how they struggled with normalizing the variation. I know I have 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> but this is the, hopefully maybe the last point. Uh, so they, they decided recently when they saw this, they said, yeah, we're all in. And they hooked into it. Now they're using it. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it solves a heck of a lot. And it's a great building block to start with. All right, I'm going to go past that. We need this trusted thing. I sort of made that point. What's the next step beyond step one? We need the same kinds of things for phenotypes, diseases, and then we can put together and really start managing this variant knowledge broad, uh, in a broad way. Um, not enough time for that, obviously, because I have three seconds for, oh, I'm over. Uh, <laughs> that's going up, not down. All right, and so we'll do that next time. Uh, and thanks for everyone there. And by the way, on my slide deck, there's some links at the end if you want to go check out some of the things I mentioned. And that's it. Great, thank you. Clarifying questions? All right, well, there'll be an opportunity in a, uh, in a little bit for the, during the discussion section. Uh, next up is, is Chris Shute from, from Hopkins. Uh, he's going to uh, talk to us a bit about some of the harmonization around data syntax. So, 